fans and welcome to another episode of The Hambini Show. Normally, these episodes start with me in my garage. But on this occasion, which is a special occasion, it's not. We've got PowerPoint straight away. How good is that? Well, it's very good. Now, let me uh, start with this. It's my favorite famous title slide. Um, and I've decided to call my presentation this week Random Fucker Gets His TT Position Critiqued by a Five-Year-Old with a PhD in Roasting. I was going to put PhD in Reaming. And then I actually was going to put PhD in Raping, but I don't think that would go down too well with all the, uh, you know, the, um, all the politically correct mob. And to be honest, it is a bit, maybe a bit too far. By Hambini, aged five, that is yours truly. Now, this really comes from a load of people emailed me and said, um, can you have a look at my time trial position and then sort of critique it? And I was going through this so many times and generally I try and re reply to all my emails. But um, anyway, th this was going on forever and ever. So I thought, fuck this, we'll do a presentation about it. Um, so... That's what this is about. This is someone, some random fucker has sent me a load of pictures and we're gonna critique them now. Now, just before we carry on any further, I will point out that I am not an expert of any means. I am just a five-year-old with no brain power whatsoever and a complete fucking bell end. If you want an expert opinion, go and ask, mm, I don't know, maybe a cycling weekly, weekly journalist who, um, who will understand technical intricacies in such great detail that they regurgitate it. <clears throat> right. Fuck. Right. First of all, the wind tunnel problems. You know, what do they not tell you? Well, the first thing is, if you've ever been in a wind tunnel, what happens is you are in a fixed position. And normally, um, you would actually rock from side to side, left to right. And when you're actually in a wind tunnel, it's more like being on a turbo trainer. But with a turbo trainer with, that's completely fixed, and you've got these sort of arms that come out and hold your wheels in, so you're completely fixed. So there's no lateral movement. And the other thing is, when you're out on the road, you've got this um, lateral movement, which you generally call roll. You've also got a yawing movement, which is um, your micro steering corrections. Um, and that doesn't exist either in a wind tunnel. Um, the other thing is, the majority of uh, wind tunnel testing is conducted at steady state. We'll come on to that in the next few slides. Um, and some things that, you know, obviously I'm not from a cycling industry background. Thank God for that. Fucking hell, I'd slash my wrists. Oh, sorry, don't dob me in for saying slash my wrist because, you know, that's not appropriate. Um, especially when you're five. Anyway, fuck that. Right. Um, <laughs> The forward speed is not adjusted for your angle, which is a bit weird, um, but nonetheless, that's what uh, the you know the cycling greats do. Um, and realistically, I mean, a wind tunnel is only applicable if it's not windy or if you're in a velodrome, or you can go over. Well, I put 50 kilometers per hour there, but it's more like 70 kilometers per hour. But anyway, uh, and generally, it is a marketing tool, so you know. Come to my wind tunnel, I can save you 25 watts. It's complete horseshit. <laughs> it's complete horseshit. Complete horseshit. Right. Um, and then the, the final point is individuals really need five or six weeks to get used to a different position. So if you get a seat, for example, a, a bicycle seat, um, and then change it, you really need a long period of time uh, to get used to it, to decide whether you actually like it or don't like it. When you put the new seat on, there's an unfamiliarity there, and that's not not liking it, it's the unfamiliarity that you don't like. Right, your angle versus drag. Now, where's me fucking pen, man? Shit. Ah, oh. bollocks. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Um. Uh, let me turn the pen on. <laughs> Fuck. Right. No. All right, pen's working. Right. Fuck that. Let's get back to business. Right. 
I'm just moving me shit. Oh, fuck's sake. Right. Let's just check it's working. Fuck, where's me? Oh, yeah, it's working. Right, your angle versus drag, the bullshit. This is a typical graph that you get all over the um, interweb. And it is from Boyd Cycling. I'm not picking on them in particular, but it generally shows um, what goes on. So if you look here, you've got drag. Yeah, and then you've got your angle here, which is increasing as you go that way. Now, all of these lines, wherever the fuck they are, all of them sort of go down. Yep, yeah. like that. Um, so you get a general reduction in drag versus increasing your angle. Um, but that doesn't happen in real life. And then you go and approach these people, and I've approached a few, such as Flow Cycling, you know, those wonderful individuals who you know, do all this CFD, but then forget to put spokes into their CFD models. Um, that doesn't happen in real life. And we'll come to why you get this phenomenon in a minute. Um, and the other thing, I mean, who measures drag in grams? I've never seen it measured in grams other than from cycling companies. Absolutely drivel. Never seen it in my life. Right, here is some random punter on a bike and you're looking at him in plan view, overhead view. Um, now, let's assume he is in a wind tunnel and the wind is replicating a speed of 40 kilometers per hour. Now you have to forget the direction of the arrows because in effect, he's pedaling into zero wind at 40 kilometers per hour. Does that make sense? I mean, I could have drawn the arrow. That way, but for the purposes of this uh, presentation, it don't really matter. Your angle is when you are not head on into the wind. So it would be like that. Um, and then again, the wind from the wind tunnel is set up at, for example, 40 kilometers per hour. His speed is in that way. Yeah. And then you've got this component of drag that way. Now, what happens is because of this change in your angle, his forward speed, which is this arrow here, is reduced. So instead of him being 40 kilometers per hour like this one, he is actually now at 38.6. In order to replicate the same speed, yeah, that, um, so, so to replicate the speed, what would you would have to do is you'd have to extend this line. So that became 40 and then draw across to there. And then that will be a new wind tunnel speed and it's just an addition of vectors that's all the next thing that the um, powers that be neglect to tell you is the basic drag formula right so drag is if, if you read it read what they say is cd which is the um coefficient of drag for a particular object so coefficient of drag for um like a cylinder is different to a coefficient of drag for a a square bluff body the area is the frontal area so the, you know if you're looking at me it's that's my face that's the frontal area of x meters squared and then this term here half row density v squared is dynamic pressure now cycling experts believe this value is fixed so they say cd is fixed um and it's fixed for a given value a given position and equipment choice. In reality, that is not the case. And you know, this can be proved all over. It's very easy to prove, but um, the reality is it looks more like this. So the CD equation is all of this. Okay. What that's saying is, um, as you go faster, your CD will change and will increase. And that's to do with surfaces generating lift. So this sail effect that if you go around weight weenies listening to is all because of this business here. So you get an increase in what's called lift coefficient. Does That's aerodynamically in an aircraft, what you would call it. Um, but 
in a in a cycling environment. I don't know what it's called. And I don't read the cycling literature because it's usually for the horse shit. So um, yeah, that's where we are. Right. If you haven't seen this, this is pretty obvious. So this is the average wind tunnel. So the these parallel streamlines are um, air coming to hit the random punter. And this is what happens on the road. So if you are um, on the road, you've got a lot more instability and turbulence uh, that's happening. Now, if you get a, I mean, you can experience this when a truck goes past you, you you're in its wake. Or if you go cycling along and then there's a hole in the hedge and boom, you're in a bit of bother. Right, <laughs> this is my, um, uh, my favorite slide. Right. <laughs> Here's some quotes from some self-proclaimed experts. Welcome to the velodrome. This is just like riding outdoors. <laughs> I think I need some water. Oh God, if I was an expert, which I'm not, and I said that, oh. You get ha separation in a high pressure area, I put that bit in brackets, at the front of a helmet. I've never known anything in my life so stupid as that statement. If you are an aerodynamic, I mean, if you're an aerodynamic expert, crikey, when you've got high pressure area, uh, air, and we'll, I'll show you some pictures of this shortly, you cannot get separation because high pressure air is standing still, okay? It's not moving, so it can't separate. Right, and then um, some quotes from experts. All right, I was struggling to find some, you know, applicable quotes, um, but this one was quite appropriate. Assume everyone is a fucking idiot until proven otherwise. Um, that includes aerodynamics all over the world. Basic, the pro basic premise is, and the thing I get pissed off about is, it is difficult for the average person to know if they're being fed horseshit or not because you can't see it, you can't feel it, and it's difficult to measure. Um, and people exploit that, and I think it's fucking outrageous. Right, <laughs> whoever designed this is from the planet Gonorrhea. Uh, the only uh, other place I've seen this much shit is in a sewage works. Um, uh, Tom fuckery couldn't stop this wanker from designing a shiter set of wheels. I'd rather shit in my hands and clap. Yes, some of the some of the people that I work with, who I would say are experts, out of me, I'm only five years old, but anyway, um, yes, I mean that was it. I mean, the other one was these wheels suck more than a fucking porn star. That was another great comment. Um, anyway, right, I digress. I just love putting these random fucking shit slides in just to um, to piss people off sometimes. Right, right, basic. Right, this this is. How are you going to go about improving the riding position? So, first of all, the biggest effect on drag is the rider. You know, don't be under any, any illusions. If you are going to go fast, you need to sort your position out first. So, the head and the upper back are areas where you can, you know, really create some uh, difference. Hand and forearm, so that's the next in the sequence. And then finally, optimize equipment. So, the wheels is the biggest player in drag. Handlebars frame um, and then I'll caveat all of my comments with uh, this I'm not from a biomechanical uh, background and it would be ridiculous for me to say you know I can give you a aerodynamic position and be make it biomechanically efficient I can't because that's not my bag of tea I don't really care um, so you know that's it so you know make sure you understand that when we go through the, the next bit Right, meet the random fucker, Mr. Peak Talk. So this is his YouTube channel. Here he is. There, um, and he's got, he's, to be honest, his, his uh, YouTube channel is pretty good. Um, so he contacted me with some pictures and we thought we'd do this. I'm sure there's gonna be a reaction video to this, which is gonna be equally full of piss taking. So uh, he's obviously much better at um, uh, photo chop than me because he has managed to get his um, like background to be brake pads, whereas my background is a door um, and some shit fitting shelves that I got from IKEA. Well, I didn't get them. 
fuck that. Right. Uh, so he is an engineer, and uh, you know that instantly um, you know, moves you up the echelons. Marine background? Question mark. I don't know. It's just because he talked about bow waves, so I thought he had a marine background. TT cyclist. Obviously, he's a YouTube personality, and the one that triggered me was he couldn't bring himself to buy one of my bottom brackets because he's an engineer and you know, it would oh, I don't know what the word is there's just like engineering pride and I like that I like that so he didn't want to do that um, and uh, he claimed to have an M7 that's a capital M7 fit on the back and a small P7 on the front okay right so here we have some pictures of him cycling in the middle of a lockdown um, in, uh, where's this? It looks like Bristol. Oh no, no, it's not Bristol. I think that's Hong Kong. Um, so here he is anyway. So uh, that's his giant bike. He's got uh, some fast sports back wheels. Well, I, think, I don't know what his front wheel is, but probably a fast sports one as well. He's very, very tall. Um, so he's got quite a, uh, you know, large bike, quite, well, his seat's really high and his handlebars are really high. Here's another one of him riding along. Uh, interesting socks. Ooh. Um, again, you know, just another another shot of him riding along. I think that's a gyro helmet, a gyro helmet. Um, a giant Trinity bike. Uh, again, sort of like a three-quarter angle, is that what you call them? And this is sort of semi from the front. Um, so that's his position there. Uh, he's into his time trial. And then finally, um, here he is uh, in his uh, apartment, um, you know, riding along, practicing his time trial position on his turbo trainer. Um, yeah. Thing to key thing to note in all of this is um, one size does not fit all. Uh, it's like getting a set of shoes. You can't just slip into someone else's shoes and expect them to fit. If you've got some different geometrical dimensions, which most people have, um, then you have to adjust for that. So um, yeah, that's that's that. Now, low hanging fruit, I was gonna use some other terminology there. Um, you know, the first thing, if you look at it is, the helmet tail that he's got, this one here, oop, there, is too short. And um, the other thing is, and I'm, it might be just him in this shot, his head, is a bit too high so he'd be doing well to either scrunch his shoulders up or bring his head down only by a little amount and I'll show you why in a minute um, this is a chap called I forgot his surname Rossi ah oh, sorry I forgot his first name Rossi but this this is ideal okay because there's no divot because in the case of peak torque, he's got a divot there. Whereas what you don't, what you would prefer is no divot, so it's straight across the back. Um, and that is because of this. So you've got separation points. So I've done the separation point for uh, peak torque here. I call him Mr. PT, and uh, the other chap, Mr. Rossi, is here. So that is effectively where he's going to start getting problems so he's going to start billowing off there yeah i mean some of it may reattach but it's unlikely that that's almost a cliff edge that's gone on here on this one that will almost certainly remain attached and that's what you want to do you want to you want to get the airflow so it remains attached to you the easiest way to avoid well the easiest way to do that is to have smooth transitions and not sharp cliff edges now the other thing is the praying mantis is quite poor in turbulent conditions so in what i've done is i've just gone and got my doodle pen and then drawn around with basically an area of nothing in uh in the case of mr pt and then the same area of nothing in the case of mr rossi so um this is this is clearly better, but and you have to caveat it again. This is 
dependent on where you took the picture in the stroke. So his leg is, is at the top of the stroke, whereas in this case, it's not. It's, it's down here on that one, and it's about that position on that one. But what, what I'm trying to say is, you want to avoid having this. Now it's not always, technically, it's not always possible because you might not be able to bend forward or you might um, you know, be so tall that you cannot avoid having that. But what I'm trying to say is, you need to minimize it. The other thing is this. So this is the hand position for the praying mantis. Okay, at, in, um, turbulent conditions so if it's like not you know air is is swirling around and it's generally what happens in most of northern Europe or if you're on on roads that are uh, you know lined with hedges and hedges mainly um, that you get more drag because it's not a good position in terms of um, you know turbulent conditions it's, it's much better suited to still conditions and that's because you tend to sit higher on the bike. It might be good from a power generation point of view, but it's not so good from a static point of view. The um, This method, which is having what people will call low hands, is aerodynamically more efficient for most people. And this chap has got, I'd say, probably one of the better positions that I've seen. Um, ideally, what you want to do is you want the forearm and the elbow to be in line with the top of your knee and that is generally considered to be you know, a rule of thumb that's worth noting general considerations um i've just said that so yeah low arms that's that's the way forward um you are dynamically more stable, so you have better steering control with your arms in a lower position because your center of gravity is lower. So that is, you know, that is that. That's a fact. Um, the actual position of the hands um, at the front is largely immaterial because you are a ram pressure side. So when you are going into um, into the wind, air is hitting the wind. Uh, sorry. When, you, when your object is going into the wind, air is hitting it and it's being stopped still. As it stops still, its pressure increases, so it won't separate. Trailing edge, on the other hand, is you know if, if this is the object and um, you've, you've got an area of nothingness behind it, it tends to billow over the top. So that is a lot more critical. So your ide ideal aim is to stop flow separation um, or make it separate cleanly. Now, next thing, equipment. So in the case of uh, uh, Pete Talk, his equipment choice, I'd say, is good. He's got a good choice of bike. So the Giant uh, Trinity is a, a decent um, uh, bike, especially for a tall rider. And again, the use of a rear disc, if you can get away with it, is worth doing. I mean, the, the gain from a rear disc is massive. The only thing that I would say is worth commenting on for him is, and I don't know if it's doable or not, he would be better off if he kept the same position, moving the uh, base bar upwards. Um, so you'd increase the number of spaces under the stem and move the base bar upwards. Um, and that's because the distance between your hands and your base bar you want to minimize because they're all, they're, you get an aerodynamic advantage as you pre-disturb the air and you're going to have to disturb it anyway. So you pre-disturb it at the highest point and carry on. Um, and then the other comment for him is I would change his helmet and I'll cover the helmet in a minute. Here we have some um, pictures of uh, where, where the base bar has moved up towards the, the arm pad. So this one here is a fine example of it. Now, obviously, this um, may not be achievable, but I've just put it in here to, to give you a, um, an indication of what you should aim for. The helmet. Now, the helmet is the critical component. Now, in the case of uh, Rossi on the left, we've got this kind of airflow around it. So it comes along, round and over, okay? This point here 
is called a stagnation point. So the velocity at that point is zero. Um, and that is because you've got a pressure PT equals PS plus half rho V squared. So what that's saying is total pressure, which is this term here, oh bollocks, is equal to the static pressure plus the dynamic pressure. Okay, if you if you have zero velocity, this term is gone. So you've got PT equals PS, so your static pressure and your total pressure are the same. So at this point here, I mean, I'm just talking maths. Oh, sorry, I'm not an expert. Um, at this point here, the, the flow is moving at zero velocity. Okay, it's a stagnation point. Now, in the case of, um, you know, uh, Pete, well, Pete Talk here, and it's not so evident on this rider's uh, uh, picture, but there's a cliff edge. Now, uh, this chap has the same helmet that I have, which is this Met helmet. Is it a Met drone? Met drone, yeah. So he's got a Met drone. Um, and on the back, we've got a hole. Now, what happens is, in this case, the airflow is um, looking something like that. Yeah, so again, we've got air comes in over around here and away we go. But this helmet has got some vents, which you can see here. What that does is this black line that I've just drawn is an air rear or it's an airflow pattern where air comes in through the helmet and then goes out the back. As it does that, it does two things. First of all, it ventilates your head. And then the other thing is it prevents separation here. Okay, but be under no illusions, this system on this side, where you've got uh, no gap, is superior. It is significantly superior to this. Okay, so the vents is a bit of a cunning way to try and keep the flow attached. It doesn't work all the time, especially if you are, um, uh, first of all, if you move your head up and down, <laughs> that's, that's the first key thing. And the second is if you are in really swirling conditions, it does not work well at all. Now, this is basically an application of um, uh, slot, slat aerodynamics. So normally, if you took your, your wing um, at a certain angle, you'd get all this blow over. Okay, if you have the slat there or the slot, and the flow that comes through here is accelerated and it sticks. And it's a bit more apparent in this one. What that's really saying is you can increase your angle of attack and then not have the flow separating. Um, and that takes us to the end. Now, if you've got any questions, then um, ask them in the comment box below. I do try and answer them all. Uh, well, no, I don't. Fuck that. <laughs> I read them all, and then I answer uh, as many as I can. Um, if you've uh, if you enjoyed this and want some more of this type of presentation, then um, do also comment in the box below. Whack the subscribe button, and uh, please check out uh, the t-shirts. They're coming soon. Thanks, and bye bye.